Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned before, it was my honor to uh, participate in this uh, uh, event. And uh, so I have actually a professor at the Fudan University and I was a former colleague of Professor Chen uh, uh, in Alibaba and in Ant Group. And then I recently also started a company uh, called uh, uh, Wuxian Guangyan, also English name is uh, Infotech. So really, I'm, I will talk about AI from practitioner's perspective uh, since I was working at Alibaba, building the AI infra for Alibaba and then later for Ant Financial. But then also throwing some uh, more, I'll say, um, technology perspective, okay. Uh, I think later this year, there's a the Sam Altman, who is the founder of OpenAI, said AI, AGI is going to be a massive driver for productivity. It could double the world GDP only in a decade. It was controversial, but at the same time, it was uh, uh, gaining a lot of attention. Okay, people thinking, okay, this might be something important for the growth of economy. But you know, the AGI has been there for a while, and I was uh, invited to attend uh, the a, a future investor initiative in uh, Riyadh, the capital of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi. Uh, during the meeting, we're talking about AGI and the ASI, artificial super intelligence. Uh, the, the one crucial topic is the will scaling law lead us to AGI. So I was saying actually earlier this year, uh, I was saying. Yes, uh, uh, LMs, uh, large language models, are super helpful, but they basically compress a lot of data from the internet, all the public available data. And by data summarization, you simply summarize all the information online, all the public accessible data into a, 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 a enormous, uh, enormous number of parameters, okay? But, but it only can do fast thinking. Fast thinking meaning you make predictions, the predict next token, you predict they give the next sentence, but it lacks the capacity of rigorous multi-step reasoning. Okay, it's called slow thinking. Okay, in the famous book read, written by Kahneman, right? It's called thinking fast and slow. And by lacking this capacity, really, uh, I think it is simply impossible to reach AGI based on pre-trained LMs by the scaling law. Scaling law, the, let, let, me, let me explain what's a scaling law, okay, for the audience who don't, doesn't know the scaling law at all. The, this is fairly simple. It means the more data you have, the larger the model, the larger the model is, the better the performance, the better, the more accurate the prediction is. So that, that's the idea for, that's the, the central argument uh, in, in scaling law. But you see, the LMs was our chat GPT is the starting point for for uh, the this uh, AGI, right? But there is a very interesting paper uh, released uh, late in the summer of this year, published in June uh, by professor from MIT and all the uh, institutes. The central argument in this paper is that language is a tool for communication not a for thinking process. It's, it's not for thought. They, they gave a very a convincing uh, examples uh, to demonstrate this uh, uh, statement. Basically, there are some patients who couldn't, who cannot speak clearly, but who, who can conduct, but can conduct thinking, uh, analytical thinking uh, very accurately. And uh, on the other hand, some people couldn't uh, uh, conduct the thinking process clearly, but they can speak um, beautifully, right? So they give uh, many examples, but the whole argument is if language is not the, the vehicle for, for thinking, then what can we do using LMs for, you know, thinking uh, for anything that relies on thinking, rigorous thinking, okay. And luckily, uh, I think in September, uh, September this year, OpenAI released uh, O1 to demonstrate that actually we can do a lot more than LOMs. 
essentially it's, it's uh, putting layman's terminology. It's like uh, AlphaGo, the, the technology. Let me explain O1, what is it? It's a fairly simple. You can think of that as a the AI program for playing Chinese game Go combined with LOMs, okay, the large language models, put them together. Then you have this so-called L1, O1 model from, from OpenAI. But really, it demonstrates the capacity of slow thinking. So uh, my friend, who is also the, the, the leading scientist in OpenAI uh, on this O1 project, uh, Norm Brown, he said, like playing a, a poker game, if you give the AI 10 seconds to think, you can outperform a model that was, say, 10,000 times bigger numbers of parameters, 10,000 times bigger, and uh, takes and also does better than a model with 10,000 times of training time. So essentially, it's treating the training time towards the test time, okay? And that opens the box for a new scaling law. But also that demonstrates it's, uh, I'll say, outstanding or surprising capacity in logical reasoning, particularly for coding, for scientific problems in like, uh, I show you in the figure, why the competition math you can see O1, O1 preview outperform GPT-40 by a huge margin. And also in the PhD test, we used to joke, uh, chat GPT is like a student from elementary school, but now you can see it does really well in PhD level scientific questions. Okay, so that says it can do rigorous scientific multi-step reasoning, okay. And also you can see the, the, the scaling law it changed from training time. I show you on the right panel. One is for training time, one is for inference time, test time. The x-axis is log scale. The y-axis is accuracy. You can see it's a linear in log scale. Basically means you will have more test time. You can you can do, you can do the job much better. Okay, that's the so-called new scaling law. Let's give this slide. It's really technical. Basically shows you. How does it, how O1 does its job? Basically, it's a thinking process. At each time point, it will examine multiple possibilities and check how likely it's good, how good is it, and carry on the process again and again, okay, in an iterative manner. However, uh, O1 underperforms okay, in an open-ended, unstructured domains. So that's a, a well observed. It's not surprising because O1 relies on a very far. It's like solving a geometry problem. It's really hard to find the, the, the solution, but once you have it, it's really easy to check. It's a correct knot, the proof is a correct knot. But for real world applications, like uh, once open-ended, unstructured, like writing, professional writing, writing a financial report is not a single metric, then it's a lot harder. It's a very hard for current O1 technologies, okay? So that that's a, actually, this statement is by Sequoia. It's a, it's a famous VC firm, yeah, worldwide. Basically said, what makes reasoning hard with the current method is, it's, it's basically strawberry, it's really, it's O1 based, another name of O1 is strong domains very similar to logic, like uh, coding, math, but not good at open-ended, unstructured problems. What, what we have been working on essentially is uh, to address pro reasoning problems in open domain, like writing, like investment, like um, compliance. There's so many possibilities. How do you do it? So essentially we're thinking, okay, there's new possibilities to combine logical inference with neural nets. It's like a sy symbolism with a connectionism. Put them together, okay? That's like a two schools of AI, put them together. Once you do that, this is like an integration with type one, type two for trustworthy AI. Okay, this is a technical architecture. Basically, there's a logical engine, there's a neural nets engine. In one engine, you put them together, you load together and you you, you give out a controllable, explainable result for trustworthy outputs. And we released a tech report in, the, in July this year, and also 
we compared our results in a Shijie Ren Gong Jinan Da He in Shanghai. It's called the WAC conference. Uh, yeah, just save the trouble for translator. Uh, in that, we, we announced the model, but we compare that with GPT-4 Turbo and the GPT-4.0. You can see for the four benchmark logic uh, inference benchmark data sets, we all outperform GPT-4. Essentially, that's, a, that's the, the beautiful strength once you combine logic inference with neural nets, okay? You can cross the board, it, it, by a large margin, it, can, it, it does a much better job than GPT-4. And then we actually we set up a, a logic reasoning track for AI for science task uh, competition in Shanghai. We say, okay, why do we open up this competition in July? And there are lots of new ideas coming up, okay? So that's mainly you're talking about the newest development in AI. It's so basically switching from pre-trained large language models to uh, test time uh, inference, the test time uh, scaling law. Basically, it's uh, like a reinforcement learning, like the technology you use for AlphaGo, for playing Go, AI Go players, okay? But not talking about the applications, how it's going to be used in practice. Simply put, AI is becoming a service. It's translating many things. It's not just a tool. It's, it's a new service platform, okay? It's a tool for pro raising productivity, okay. SaaS was uh, the traditional, it's a classical way of using software. Uh, it's called SaaS, but it's software as a service. It reduces the cost, but it, it takes time, okay, uh, to build a good SaaS software. But the AI is uh, changing the game dramatically, okay. It reduces the cost. It has a strong generalization capacity. You don't have to fix, you don't have to customize your your uh, module in your SaaS software for uh, clients because AI nowadays can generalize much easier than previous uh, SaaS software. And also there's strong, uh, for SaaS, for example, for the adoption of SaaS in China uh, has been really challenging, really difficult because of bottom up, bottom up in innovation. But with AI, it's, it's cross the board, across actual nations, so all embracing AI. I think this wave of, a technology, new technology, probably gonna have a much faster pace compared to SaaS in both actually in China and also in US. So actually talking about the SaaS, I will also look further back in history, like internet wave. So in the past for internet, for the internet uh, uh, dot-com wave, first you have the infrastructure development that's like a representative, representative company is Cisco. Like back in 1990s, Cisco is, or in early 20, uh, 2000s, Cisco is doing really, or it's doing really well. But later Google, Facebook came up. So that, those companies are application companies. It's like building the basic infrastructures, then the applications, so like building the roads and then, then cars. It's the same, same, same story. But then the application will drive the better infrastructures, coordinate all the GPUs in an enterprise. We need more training platforms, inference platforms, even platforms for building agents. Because once you're agents, really you have all the applications. That is beyond the LM. So you can really finish a task like arranging, buying a ticket for me tomorrow or writing a financial report for me. Then look at the different industries. I think probably every industry will be have will be uh, not restructured at least have a huge impact uh, impacted by AI. So uh, this is a report from Goldman Sachs, and it released the list last year and this year of also expect for the next six months what domain what areas will be uh, will be influenced by AI. It's basically, adoption rate of AI. It's not surprising information, professional writing, science, scientific, technical, education, finance, retail. But that's exactly what we've been working on. Essentially, we focus on infra, AI, native applications for professionals, AI for science, for scientific research. 
and the trustworthy AI for financial applications, so for health applications. I show you a few applications in practice. So this is a application uh, we did for a uh, financial firm, securities firm. Basically, it's, it's professional writing for financial analysts based on the trustworthy AI. It, once you have financial reports, where you look at into all the financial, uh, a company financial report, analyze the data, and also from also the unstructured data from internet, combine them together, generate an in-depth analysis. And uh, I show you what's under the hood. It actually requires a multi-step reasoning. So the, in this one, we show you like one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven steps inference. That is beyond, uh, say, LMs. It really requires a, a rigorous thinking process. It's like research flows, the logic flows, and how do you put them together? And that will be super useful for many industries, for mission critical applications. And that's another, that's a, that's another application. We, so revenue prediction. We use a neuro symbolic uh, inference. Actually, we implement the thinking process in Mongo, uh, the 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 part, previous partner of, of, of uh, Warren Buffett. Essentially, you examine multiple factors like uh, market uh, uh, size, of market the competitive landscape, uh, the 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 upstream downstream uh, logistics, and so on. Bef and then put them together to have the final outcome. It's a long thinking process. Once you have it, you have really the you can generate the the report, the summary. Okay. But that's only for the digital world. What about the physical world? So Sora, this year from OpenAI talking about the video generation. That looks like real video, but it's generated by AI. But we can go beyond that. We can look into signals from, uh, which is uh, unperceived by human beings, like sensory data from satellites, from a microscope, from all the sensors, right? Scientific sensors. So we build a weather forecast model, for example. That's what we show here. It, it, you can see the very accurate prediction. It overlays the, the green curve is our prediction. The black curve is what's happened, a typhoon. Uh, uh, the, that's the basic map actually near the Southeast Asia Sea. And uh, there's a yellow curve that's from a European Weather Forecast Center. That's viewed as the best weather forecast center for a mid-range weather forecast. So essentially, we use a similar technology for LMs, but with a new technology changes, essentially because we're not predicting next word, uh, next token, but we're predicting whether seven days later or 30 days later, or even 45 day, day, days later. So you couldn't use exactly the, the, the LMs used for ChatGPT. We changed that actually with our design, we can do a very good job for weather forecast, not only for say 15 days for weather forecast, but also for say sub-seasonal prediction. So that, that's, that meant to be 30 days to uh, 45 days in advance. But also we're doing, for, doing that for super resolution, like one kilometer, one, one hour, okay, in China. And the right panel is a result from actually from a copy from the website of European Mid-Range Weather Forecast Center. And the x-axis is the the days, how many days in advance the prediction is. The y-axis is accuracy. And the, on the beginning, see all the methods are similar, but once you further in the time, the all the methods decay. The performance all all the methods decay, but our method is the best. All the perform say graph cards, the method from DeepMind from Google and also from other competitors. Okay. We also build a model not only for the large scale like weather system, but uh, even for climate climate system, but also we do it for microscopic uh, level. Uh, that is uh, for micro RNA, for actually sRNA, that stands for small interference RNA. This type of RNA can suppress the expression of genes that cause a disease, right? So this is uh, a new modality for drug design. So this project, the, the estimated the market uh, is uh, 20, 12 billion for this year, and uh, will increase to 39 billion 
in five years. So what we did is essentially first using multimodality uh, foundation models to parse all the patterns legally and generate a database for sRNA. <coughs> 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 Then we build the AI, we call Nuwa <coughs> Foundation Model. That gives the predicting error near down to 8% from all the way to 40%. And then that gives us a, a high promise for real world application in the new drug design for sRNA drug design. And uh, there's another one that's for, that's for weather, that's for sRNA, that's a large molecule. But we can look at an even smaller scale. That's a look at the molecular scale. Uh, essentially, we I think the, the first equation is the Schrodinger equation. That's the equation for the for the universe for the micro at the microscopic level. But then we build a pre-trained foundation model for that. Instead of to predict the entropy, the 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 energy gap, and so on, then that's instead of using traditional molecular dynamics of using the large scale simulation on HPC, we can do it much faster and uh, uh, and efficiently, accurately. And the address problems couldn't be solved by traditional, say, molecular dynamics or DFT. Uh, we, that has a lot of applications, like uh, for uh, battery design, for a made a catalytic optimization. Basically, how do you analyze? How do you optimize? Uh, a catalyst, catalyst, okay, catalyst design. And also, of course, for uh, carbon uh, caption, okay, for basically CO2 uh, uh, caption as well. So basically new materials. Uh, so that I just show you a bunch of applications, essentially from uh, finance uh, to weather forecast, uh, to drug design, to material design, uh, but Essentially, what we what we really want to do is uh, is basically tie technology is a driving force for economy. Actually, as quote uh, Brian Arthur's uh, quote, uh, the economy is the expression of technology in the book uh, Nature of Technology, which I read uh, with a huge pleasure and a very inspiring book. But at the same time, AI also brings risk, right? So. AI can do so much, then all the countries, all the nations are, I say the international competition and also between nations and also industries. It will, on one hand, will, I will say the drive the fast growth of AI, but at the same time, I think uh, humankind face existential, economic and societal risk, right? In the long run. It's, it's that, it's, I don't know how long it is, but we need to be cautious. So what I'm thinking is uh, we couldn't and we shouldn't start with the development of AI, but we need explainable, controllable AI. We need more embrace, we get more, we, we need to embrace open source. We need international collaborations, uh, co uh, communications. And that's essential, that's important. Otherwise it's like a prisoner dilemma. It's like, oh, I want to be better and stronger then yeah, then it's dangerous. And also the last point, I put a question mark because I don't know how it will unfold in the future. Basically it's a blockchain with AI. The, 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 the purpose of blockchain to me is really decentralized the trust system, but the AI is centralized, all the data putting together. But the, you see, you put all the eggs in one spot, it's dangerous. One, one, one bag is, one, one basket is dangerous. So can we decentralize? But then that, that's, that, that is also, I will slow down the technology development of AI at the same time, because that will, that will require more engineering effort and slower and harder. But at the same time, maybe there's some additional benefit. How do we marry that together? So I will say decentralized or not. Okay, so that's my sharing and uh, thank you. And I will look forward uh, for the panel discussion later.